confirm our time. It's 7.30, so I'm gonna talk till 8.30 and then we'll do 15 minutes of Q&A. Is that okay? Is that good that with everyone? sounds just fine, yeah. Okay, great. All right, let me share my screen and it looks like someone just entered the waiting room. I got them, yeah. All right, good, good, good. So, so glad that you're with me and you took some time out of your busy life to join us and I hope we'll have a little fun. And the topic is a serious one, but I hope that you'll see that we can approach it at least the way that we teach it and talk about it with kids in a bit of a light way, even though when it's happening, anger, frustration, and meltdowns is nothing close to light or um, fluffy. And so we're gonna talk about meltdowns and shutdowns and how we can teach these coping skills uh, to children to overcome their frustration and anger. And yeah, so if you have questions, it's gonna be hard for me to answer in real time. So definitely write them in, in the chat and we'll, we'll do a and A time at the end. And this is me. And uh, we're gonna talk about very sp specific coping skills for anger. And I, the book that I wrote, my first book was released in September. And this book is all about how caregivers, teachers and, and parents and caregivers can uh, support kids and encourage them to repeat positive coping skills until they become habits. And also there are some, some of the things we talk about tonight in terms of handling frustration. We're gonna talk about the emotional GPS tonight, which is that's in the book. And uh, the book also talks about some behavior sort of um, consequences and behavioral strategy also to help shape kids' behavior towards the really effective coping that you're looking for. So, but tonight we're talking about frustration and temper. And to begin, I wanted to point out, there are certain cognitive traits, the way that people think about the world that are like the kindling for anger and frustration. These things set people up to have anger. And I wanted us to first identify them so you know what to look for. And if you're thinking of a specific child or children See if you can see some of these traits in them as we go. And the same thing when we get to the coping skills, I don't know if every single coping skill will resonate with your child, but if you can leave with three or four or five things that you can use, that would be a successful night, I think. So the first one is weak inferential learning. Uh, when kids cognitively have a hard time inferencing, making educated guesses about what's happening in their world, then uh, they don't learn from their mistakes. They don't learn um, exactly how to cope with things at the same rate as other kids do. Uh, so the very mainstream kids, neurotypical kids, seem to develop coping skills almost invisibly and naturally. How did they learn that? But um, many of the kids who have meltdowns have trouble inferencing. So we wanna do a lot of direct instruction. We wanna teach them how to cope because they're not picking it up naturally. But that's one of the triggers is that they're not naturally learning their coping skills. The second piece is critical. This is one of the central causes of people who are frequently frustrated or mad. Prolonged egocentrism. So egocentrism is a state in childhood and it's expected in in babies and in, in early child, childhood. Egocentrism is an approach to the world in which the child is trying to get his or her needs met, right? To get needs met. And they approach the world in terms of that. And it's a very much a um, attention and relief situation. And so for instance, consider the baby. Baby's hungry, baby cries, right? The attuned adult, the caregiver sees, oh, you're uncomfortable right now. Maybe you need a bottle. Maybe you need a diaper change. So you figure it out. We relieve the tension. Baby's okay. Ah, they stop crying right? when they get what they need. So this egocentrism is expected still age three, age four, preschool, kindergarten, that's sort of a tipping point. And then it should be on the wane up until around age seven or eight, according to uh, Piaget. And um, but for many kids, 
who have this as sort of a central core hardwired piece of them, they may linger longer in egocentrism up until the upper elementary years, some kids into middle school or beyond. You might know some adults who are egocentric and, and approach the world, of, I've got to get my way, right? And so now if you want to get your way, let's go to number three. If you're flexible about it, I want to get my way, but okay, this time I can wait. But if you have number three along with number two, now you're in trouble. Now you most likely are going to have some kind of a meltdown. So if you are cognitively rigid, if you are an inflexible person, right, you can't shift off of a thought or an idea that you have. And if you can't shift off of a thought or an idea, what happens? You wanna get your way. I've gotta get my way, I've got, it's gotta go my way. And, and someone says no, and you're like, what? It's got to be my way, right? That's frustrating. So for the person who can't accept things that they can't control, they can't let go, that causes frustration and anxiety. So they need direct instruction for people who are egocentric. What's the big picture? For people who are inflexible, they need to learn about flexibility and how to be flexible. And number four, check this out. Um, it's interesting. People who, have, who are not very assertive, they don't have really great um, self-advocacy skills, that's a trigger for meltdown, for frustration. Why? Well, because let's say something happens and they need something or want something, but they don't really have the language or the assertiveness to say it, so they don't get their needs met, right? So now they're building up in frustration. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And someone who's kind of a mild-mannered person, it might take many, many, many experiences before they get frustrated like that. But for people who are number two and three, if you're not getting your way and you can't assert yourself, kindling, right? Explosion. Number five goes hand in hand with number four. For those people who are weaker problem solvers, people who are, have, are weak in problem solving may have, um, they may, may struggle with executive functioning skills. You may have heard that. People can have weak problem solving for a lot of reasons, for difficulty with uh, language. They have language, um, expressive language challenges. Um, so if you're a weaker problem solver, this is what it looks like. Something goes wrong, right? And a good problem solver would come up with, you know, one or two or three options in their mind, which one would work? Boom, I'm gonna try that one. And then they can shift with flexibility, they can shift to plan B. But weak problem solvers, something goes wrong, right, in their face, and then they look at it, and if they don't, if they can't problem solve, right there, they're like a deer in the headlights and they melt down. Or let's say they can come up with one, one solution, right? They're gonna try that. They're gonna try that once, they're gonna try it a second time louder, a third time harder, and if they can't, if they can't flex, if they can't generate multiple options, they're gonna get madder and madder as their one solution doesn't work. So you have to be able to generate multiple options and a lot of kids don't develop that naturally. So we need to help them. Black and white thinkers, people who mentally only have two puppies of experience in their mind. It's all good or all bad, right? If you only have all good or all bad compartments in your mind for your experiences, something has to be really good for it to be in your all good column. And as soon as something is just a little bit bad, something doesn't go quite right for that person, instantly it has to get lumped into the all bad, right? The all bad uh, cubby. And then they're on this uh, roller coaster. You're up, everything's great, you're down. It's the worst, great, worst. So you'll see people who are on emotional roller coasters because their, their thinking is so black and white. They don't have shades of gray. So we're gonna teach that today. Uh, we're going to skip number seven for time, and, but number eight, we'll say, is um, for someone, we know that brain, that our, the human brain has plasticity, and we know that the human brain, whatever parts of the brain that we use, it sends more, uh, the brain develops more and more connections, right? More neurological connections are, are created when someone uses certain parts of their brain. So if someone frequently melts down and if they're frequently frustrated, what part of the brain are they exercising? 
and what part of the brain do we think that they are now um, developing faster pathways? The anger frustration part. So the person who's frustrated, the more they do it, the easier it is, the quicker that pathway is. And then you'll see people who have that, that zero to 60 emotionality, right? People who go from everything is okay to freaking out. So these are the top seven. I went over seven of them uh, for tonight. And so now let's dig in. We're gonna start using very child-friendly language to understand what anger is, how do we combat it, and how do we support these things? The first portion of what I'm gonna talk about is all gonna be, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on how to handle the most difficult times, a meltdown. And then after that, the second part of my talk, we're gonna talk about um, prevention, all the ways that we can prevent the meltdowns. But let's first talk about uh, neurology. This is the brain, only in cartoon form. And so you can teach it this way to a child as young as four and five. And then we can always make it more sophisticated for older kids. But there are three levels of the brain. In brain science, they call it the triune brain. There's three levels. And you can see there's a little dinosaur in the middle there. That's the dino brain. That's the part that's in charge of fight, flight, or freeze. The middle portion in green is the mammal brain, the mammalian brain, sometimes called the monkey brain. And that's in charge of all the social stuff, our desire to be connected. Feelings and emotions are there, like the higher order feelings like love, jealousy, um, togetherness, loneliness, all those things are in that green area. And then we have the blue part of the brain, the human brain, right? Um, that's the, the cortex and the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobe. And that's the human brain that's really brilliant. So let's get into it. When I'm teaching this to kids, I start with the dino brain. So that little bit in the middle, you know, every child seems to have a wealth of knowledge about the dinosaurs. So how big is a dinosaur brain? It's about the size of a walnut. You can make it with your index finger and your thumb. It's about this big, right? Here's a dino brain. And what did dinosaurs do all day? Did they do very complex activities? No. So on down the left, you can see that uh, the dino brain was in charge of like hunting. They would eat, they would sleep at night. Uh, then if they were a plant eater and they were under attack, maybe they would stay and fight, right? If they had horns or clubs on them, they would, they would charge. They might roar, roar to scare away a, uh, a threat. Or if they're small and quick, maybe they would run. Well, guess what that is? That's fight or flight, right? Same thing that's involved in modern day, present day meltdowns, fight or flight, it's the dino brain. And so the dino brain was in charge of that. Now a funny thing happened to dinosaurs when uh, the dinosaur brain kicked in. So let's say I'm a plant eater, I'm here nibbling on my plant and around the corner comes the T-Rex. So I sense it, I can feel the ground shake. And now I'm like, <laughs> You can see I'm breathing fast, I'm sort of panting. Invisibly, my heart is beating into my chest. Gung, 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 gung. All my muscles are clenched up and I'm on high alert. Where's the danger? Where's the threat? And I might let out a roar just in case. Roar! So these are all the same symptoms that happen in present day humans when we are really angry or melting down. We all have a dino brain. So everyone take your finger and you can feel, if you just touch the back of your head, there's a notch, that little bony protuberance, there's a notch back here. Right on the inside of that notch is your brainstem, which is the dino brain that we still have. And so the dino brain is in charge of fighting or fight and flight. So when you see someone at school or in your house going, ah, stomping. I'm so mad. I hate you. You're the worst parent in the world. All that kind of angry talk is fuel that comes out of the dino brain. But as we just established, dinosaurs weren't very smart. All they did was hunt, eat, sleep, fight. Right? So now to a child, I say, well, do you, yes, you have a dino brain, but you also have this human brain. How big is the human brain? It's about as big as your skull, right? Look at this. It's like, is this big? And so the human brain can do way more things than a dinosaur could ever do. 
and we can go down the list on the right. This group of kids said we can. Yes. We go to school, right? We can play. We can learn. Some kids said we know science. We build houses and cars. But where I'm leading the kids is self-control. That's why it's circled. We humans have uh, self-control on purpose, and we can decide whenever we want to do something. So if you don't want your dino brain to take over, you can actually decide. You have way more control than you ever thought. So if you want, if you're like this, uh, there's a trick and you can shut down your dino brain, say, dino brain, I don't need you. Shh, quiet down. I want my human brain to be in charge so I can feel better. And so this is partly a cartoony description of neurology and helps people to understand helps kids understand the dino brain, that rage part of their brain. And now they're gonna learn on purpose, they can quiet it down if they want to. And uh, so it's a dino trick and here's how we do it. So first, if, there's a, if you're a caregiver with a child who needs help, um, the, you can ask a really paradoxical question. Is there a T-Rex trying to eat you right now? You know, at school, is there a T-Rex? Here in our Toyota, is there a T-Rex? No, it's not trying to eat you. So do you need your dino brain to be as loud? No, so sort of a funny little question to ask. Some kids benefit from that. Um, and then steps two and three go together and I'm gonna teach them to you right now. So first I wanna teach you a type of slowing your breathing. So instead of this dino breathing, <laughs> right? We want to take deeper breaths. We want to do the opposite of what the dino brain wants to do. So 7-Eleven breaths is a structured way for kids to learn how to breathe. So we say 7-Eleven because it's like the store 7-Eleven and also it's a counting method. So everyone pretend that you went to 7-Eleven and you got your favorite, your favorite hot beverage. You're going to hold it right in front of you. And of course, so for me, it's hot chocolate. So I, first I want to inhale, I want to sniff and smell my delicious hot chocolate. So we're going to inhale for the count of seven. And then we're gonna exhale. We have to blow it off and cool it off because it's too hot. So we're gonna blow on our, our hot chocolate for the count of seven to cool it off. And I would love for all of us to do that right now. So we're gonna do a demo. So everyone, and just notice for yourself, how does your body feel now? Just check in with your head, your shoulders, your chest your stomach. We're going to do three 7-Eleven breaths right now, right? And then just notice how you feel afterwards. Okay, ready, get set, go. Everyone take your hot beverage, hold it in front of you if you want to do it the structured way. And now we're going to inhale for the count of seven. Ready, get set, go. We're going to do this three times. Inhale. Hold it and blow it way out for 11. 11, good. Do it a second time. Inhale for the count of seven. Seven, hold it and blow it way out. Eleven, good. Last one. Smell it, inhale. Hold it and blow it way out. Great. Okay, check in with yourself. Again, how does your head feel right now? How does your face, shoulders, chest, stomach, right? Kids will say, I feel dizzy. My stomach feels empty. My chest feels open. I feel relaxed. We just delivered a lot of oxygen to our bloodstream, to our heart. We slowed down our breathing. All that oxygen is being pumped to our extremities. So it's helping to relax our muscles right there. So that's great. The second thing, or so if you did that, that alone would help you to shut down the dino brain. Let's go to number three. We're gonna shake out our anger. Because remember, this is what anger looks like. Tensed muscles, we have adrenaline pumping through our body. So we wanna relax our shoulders, our arms. And so we say, shake out your anger. So you can just shake it out. Kids can do this under their desk at school. You might be able to do this at least one arm at a time when you're driving in traffic, you can shake it out. So everyone right now, with your cameras on or off, just shake out your arms, just get them loose. You know, you can get wiggly. I tell kids you can get silly with it. Say, so shake it out, right? And now 
for one time, just for, the, for one round, we're gonna put number two and three together. I teach kids to do this. So we're gonna take one seven eleven breath and we're gonna shake it out, out at the same time. Ready, get set, go. Inhale for the count of seven. Hold it, blow it way out for 11. Nice job. So everyone, notice how your body feels. We basically took three and then a fourth breath and you shook it out. Already, this is something you can do to calm down the dino brain. All right, so that's an intro to anger. So here's what kids need in terms of combating it. We need to destigmatize and decriminalize anger because anger often comes out with nasty words, angry, maybe dis disrespect. Sometimes there's things that are broken or people might get hurt, right? And so we focus on the behavior, but not the feeling. So we wanna help kids, especially kids who melt down to realize that they lost control. You're not a bad person, right? You might have to clean up the mess, you might have to make amends, but we're gonna, we're gonna destigmatize anger. Kids need a framework, and so do grownups, a framework to understand different levels of frustration and that different levels of frustration need different coping skills. We're gonna go over that tonight. They need to understand the dino brain. If they are someone who routinely gets mad, they need to understand why it is that they're doing it so that they can do the dino trick and they can do the opposite of it. If a child is someone who melts down and certainly melts down with any frequency, then that is the worst part of their day. No child wakes up in the morning and says, oh man, I'm gonna schedule the mother of all meltdowns at 4.45 today, right? No, it's the worst part of the day. They don't want to melt down. So they need a compassionate meltdown safety plan that doesn't rub their noses in it. How can we help them learn that they can calm down? They need safe places to get out their anger. And so that's all if they are angry. And number six is the, the bulk of my talk once we get past uh, the meltdown prevention and that and melt, the, the meltdown response, and that's prevention. We wanna help your child either not melt down at all anymore, develop self-control, or at least, at the very least, have meltdowns be way less frequent, right? If they're every day and they become like once a week or every other week, you know, every 14 days, still they linger and it's not a happy time, but that's way better than every day or multiple times a day. So decreasing frequency and hoping to extinguish them entirely. I wanna spend a little time right now on emotional GPS, also known as feelings GPS. This may remind some of you if you're familiar with zones of regulation, we actually wrote this years before zones of regulation came out. So we still stick with our GPS model here. And you'll see that it's color coded and it's number. There's a number line as well to help kids understand and caregivers understand levels of frustration. And you can see we go from calm in the purple phase to yellow, orange, and then red is meltdown city. Red is out of control, the red phase. Okay, uh, we wanna do everything in our power and help the child prevent going to a 10, right? Everything else is workable. We can work with a child. The child can use coping skills in one through nine, but 10, they can't. So here's what it means. Purple phase, your child is his or her best self. Child can play, child can learn really well. Uh, the human brain is in charge. And so as a grown up. Our job is to just look, we're looking to catch and enjoy. We can reflect what we're seeing. You are having so much fun. You two worked it out. What, what great teamwork, right? What a great conversation question. So you can, you can give very target, targeted praise, targeted reflection. Life is good. But we also wanna coach kids to know when you are really happy and relaxed, just know that something, always expect something could go wrong. So you need to be ready to handle it. You have to be, ready to be, be ready to be flexible, be ready to solve a problem. Be ready to use your assertiveness. More on that in a minute. Okay, but let's say something does go wrong. Life has frustration in it, so the child moves from purple to yellow. Now they're grr, frustrated, right? Something just went wrong. So this is hard, right? You don't like it. 
and the child's signals to you is maybe you know they get quiet or maybe their their shoulder slump or their head goes down maybe they go ah so they give you some signs of mild stress right frustration grr so at this point we want to support them by asking them how they want to handle this question form the child's calm enough we want them to practice learning their coping skills so when the child is relatively calm but there's a problem how do you want to handle this or you could say which of your coping skills do you want to use do you want to use the big deal meter or do you want to use um, a rescue thought i'm going to teach you those skills in a few minutes right uh, do you want to take a break so question form and wide open the child can handle it a wide range of ways the other thing that i want to point out is that um, when the human brain's in charge your child's brilliant brain is, is there and your, your child can think of solutions. The farther down we go down this number line into orange and red, the more a dinosaur brain takes over, the less um, your child can access his or her brilliant human brain. And by the time a child gets to 10 in the red phase, the human brain has essentially been hijacked by the dino brain. And so they don't have any logic, they don't have any rational thought and they don't have much productive language. At this point, they might be screaming, I hate you, I wish I were dead, I wanna blow up the school, right? All these things. They actually, for the most part, don't actually mean when they get to red phase. We're gonna continue. So let's say the child was in yellow briefly, but now you start to see that the child moves from um, stress to distress. The child's overwhelmed. And the signs for that are that chi your child's going to show much more sudden movements like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You'll hear guttural sounds, a little more animalistic. You know, you might see a clenched fist. Their, their jaw muscles might be popping. Clenched, uh, clenched fist, clenched jaw. They might be crying. And they're starting to lose some of their language and they're losing some of their rational thought. So here, when the child's like, ah, ah, maybe they rip their homework, right? At this point, you don't want to give a wide open question like, how do you want to handle this? Because your child doesn't have the brain power, the rational thought to answer an open-ended question. If you ask an open-ended question at this point, how do you want to handle this? Your child will likely escalate to the red phase. You might tip your child into the red phase because you're going to flood the child. So we want to narrow things. The farther down we go, we want to narrow the child's choices. So by the orange phase, ah, 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 I hate this. Two steps for the grown-up. First, you want to temporarily pause whatever demand or expectation is happening. If the child, you're trying to get the child to do homework, if you're trying to get the child to do something, you can say, whoa, wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to do X, Y, or Z right now. Let's pause. We're still going to have to do, we're, well, don't say that. Just in your mind, you know that the child's not going to get out of it. Your child still has to do that. But I'm not saying we have to do this right now. Just pause for a second. And then number two is you're gonna give an acceptable choice, left or right, okay, okay. Hold on, I'm not saying we have to finish this right now. You can either take a break here or you can take a walk, right? Um, would you like a snack or you wanna take a break? Do you want to, um, would you like a little help or would you like, or would you like to try to work on it on your, by yourself a little longer? So two acceptable choices, one choice, two options. Does that make sense? Purple phase, wide open, everything's happy. Yellow phase, open-ended, how do you wanna handle this? And then by the orange phase, acceptable choice. You can either do this or this. What do you think? What would work better for you? If, God forbid, your child reaches, you know, tips past the orange phase, now he or she is in the red phase. It's a meltdown. We're gonna spend a little time talking about how to handle a real life meltdown. This is not theoretical. Um, I have worked with kids in the throes of meltdowns at Camp Pegasus. Um, and so this is all backed by both theory and, uh, but it's been life tested. So red face, the child's out of control and it doesn't just have to be rage. The child could run away from a situation. They could elope as they say. They could shut down, they could, so it's fight, flight or freeze, but they're out of control. They could even be so giddy and silly, they could be running around laughing. They've been officially hijacked by the dino brain. Dino brain's in charge. Your child has the least amount of reason. 
right? Their fight, flight, or freeze self-preservation mode has been activated as if they feel like their life is in danger. That's how they're acting. They lose rational thought and they lose a lot of their language processing. So at this point, you should not be lecturing them on the merits of calming down, you know, why it's beneficial to get your homework done earlier, blah, blah, blah. At this point, when a child gets this mad, your message is one choice. There's only one thing to do. Your only job is to calm down. That's it. And at this point, there is no strategy. None of the preventive things, even the dino technique that I shared earlier, no strategy will work because your child, and this has happened, uh, kids will look right at their parents or caregivers and say, Mike's strategy is stupid. It never works because it doesn't work in the red phase. It can work in orange, yellow, and purple. So at this point, your only job is to calm down. So we wanna be compassionate. We know your child has lost control. Your child will feel a great deal of shame and embarrassment at the, in the back end of this for the most part. So we wanna destigmatize it. Very minimal language, you're not talking much. Okay, shh, shh. your only job is to calm down. And at this point, uh, I'm gonna need a little help from a volunteer. Anyone out in the cyber world wanna volunteer? Oh, I need someone here. So I'm gonna have my son who's uh, home with COVID, during COVID, he's gonna come help me. So I'm going to move the location of the camera. Sam, you are up. And I'm going to aim this here. And we're gonna do a little demo for you. You can sit in the black chair, thank you. I can sort of like come over here, a little aim this way. Let's do it there. Okay, so Sam is going to have a tantrum, okay? And so I am going to try to intervene. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna model it and I'll describe what I did. So let's say, of course, he's only, he's only sitting because he's taller than me. So, but he's at, he's at like kid height for me. So we don't wanna come in and be towering over the child who's tantruming because just this image of someone who's taller coming in, that will reinforce all the cues of their feeling like they're under attack, that there is a threat. So you wanna come and swoop in and you wanna get on the child's level and you're gonna say, your only job is to calm down, All right? Ready, get set, go, here we go. So you're mad, you're so mad. Oh. You are upset, your only job is to calm down. I'm gonna be over here, right? right? And then you back away. Let me do it again. Let's see, can you sort of slide a little bit closer to the sofa area actually? because I'm going to, I think it'll be a better angle for them. So I'm going to do it again. And notice what I do with my hands. You couldn't see me. My back was probably to you. I come in and I go, I take my hands and I might put them on his forearms or his hands and sort of bring them to midline. And I say, you are upset. Your only job is to calm down, right? And then I back off and give, you know, eight to 10 or more feet and so there's a reason why I do this. When you swoop in, you have a little, for one thing, I just put my hands on his forearms like this. It's not out of anger. It's just to give a little tactile sensation that might for one second snap the child out of their, out of their anger enough to hear my one sentence. You're upset, your only job is to calm down. I'll be here. So, and I bring the hands to midline. It's partly to keep myself safe from swinging if there's any swinging. Um, so you come in and again, you get low at the child's level. And you are angry. Your only job is to calm down. Okay. I'll be right here. And then while I'm here, you don't stare down the child. You shouldn't be like totally supervising and, and glaring into their eyes because again, that's a cue for danger. It's sort of a domination thing. So that the child might still feel in that state that they're under attack. So you can look diagonally, you can look over here. I can still keep an eye on Sam's safety and on what he's picking up out of my peripheral vision. So you can look. So this way you're not staring him down, but I can still see him right out of the corner of my eye, right? So that's the beginning of a, a meltdown plan. And now I'm gonna unpack that a little more. So thank you, Sam. Appreciate your help. Okay. So now I'll spend a, just a couple more 
minutes on a meltdown plan. So this is the red phase. One choice, minimal language. We're not discussing it. You can talk about everything when the child regains his or her right mind, when the human brain takes over, right? We're not talking to the dino brain. A lot of people have questions, follow-up questions about this. What if it happens here? How do we do handle this? So I wanna answer a lot of the frequently asked questions about how to handle this. Of course, you have to remain safe. A couple things. So as I mentioned, I would come in and sort of touch the child's hands, bring them to midline, say, you know, you're upset. Your only job is to calm down. I'll be over here. So over here meaning away, but nearby. Um, some people say, what if the child is um, attacking me? So then I say like, you would move away, but if the child follows you, I would say go into a room, go into the bathroom or into your room, lock the door, have your a magazine or a, a device to read and wait it out and your child might bang on the door. But if you, if your child is actually going after you, A, you have to keep yourself safe and you are the kindling. You're the fuel that's gonna keep the tantrum going longer. So if you remove that yourself, then the meltdown energy will remove it, will, will uh, wane faster. Uh, second question that often happens is, um, well, when, another thing that we do is we wanna have a meltdown plan. So during a time of peace, I like to have families come up with like a calming down spot. There could be one or two in the house. It could be the child's room. It could be another place in the house, but it is not a punishment. It's not a timeout. A calming down spot, a calm down spot is, has favorite items in it. It has um, comfy things. It might have drawing materials or stuffed animals or a favorite an old blanket. You know, anything that the child fidgets it could be something physical. Anything that's okay and safe for the child to have when he or she is in this mode. And so for some kids, if you make a calming down plan, even though their dino brain takes over, still you can, um, uh, you can say, okay, you're upset, you're upset, better go to your calm down spot. And about a third of the kids will go there voluntarily. Some kids might need an arm around, but then there's that, you know, 50, 55% of the kids that really just seem to like dig in. If you know your child is one of those, a, a digger inner, who's going to, to tantrum in place, don't try to move them, right? Know your child. Uh, same thing with the touching of the forearms. If you know that, that, um, that touch is actually going to escalate your child, then don't do that part. Just get on their level and say, your only job is to calm down, I'll be over here. But if tactile might help, use that. If your child locks up and is tantruming in place, then you clear the room and remove other family members so that they don't have to be there to witness it and comment on it, right? We just wanna keep the child safe. And here's what an anger melt and meltdown is. It's a wave of energy. It's a wave of limbic energy, that brainstem that I mentioned, and it's like a wave on the ocean. It rises, it crests, it peaks, and then it crashes on the ocean, and then it recedes. It's predictable. And so on the back end, once your child does calm down, you turn to your child and say, you did it. You calmed down all by yourself. You did that. So it's not, if you stand there and you're stroking his back, stroking your child's back, 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 then the child thinks that you are the, you're the safety blanket, right? And they become attached to you and they never develop the confidence that they can do it. So that's why we say, I'll be near you, but you're gonna calm down. And they always do. And then another thing to do on the back end of a meltdown is to, is to say, you did it, you calmed down. And you can even make it a game. Once a child is calm, you can say, wow, today you calmed down in 33 minutes, incredible. Uh, last time, it took you 35 minutes. This is a new record. You beat your record. Let's see if next time you can calm down in shorter than 33 minutes. So on the back end, we want to squeeze and squeeze a, a meltdown and see if a child can recover faster and get back to life faster. You did it. You can even reward if you have a reward system. Stickers for calming down. You're not rewarding the meltdown. You're rewarding the calming efforts. Uh, if a meltdown happens in public, like let's say you took your child to Target or the supermarket or wherever, and the child has one of those meltdowns right in the middle of an aisle, if you again have a develop a plan like a, a, a public, 
safety plan, a meltdown plan, you can say, you know, if this ever happens, we're making a beeline to the car so the child knows what to expect. Take your child by the wrist, not like down here where you can pull out pull um, the wrist out, the hand out of the socket, sort of a forearm, more solid part. And if you just start to get a nice head of steam, your child will be like walking behind uh, and you can get them out to your calming spot. If your child is too big to move, we don't wanna get into a tug of war in a public place. Your child, you might, the child might have to just drop down and it's embarrassing of course, but um, just to keep it safe, you know, your child might have to finish the, that dino brain wave uh, right there. Oops. Okay. So now let's sort of shift to the purple, yellow, and orange phases. Prevention. The next series of slides are all going to be various child-friendly coping skills lessons, things that we actually teach at Camp Pegasus or in the therapies that I do. So we call at the outset of just about any therapy process, we talk about taking the road to happiness. Here's the road to happiness. Um, so let's say that you're driving along, you're on the road of your life, and then there, the road splits, and you can see that there are two roads. One is the road to happiness, and you can take that. You know, I always ask a group, raise your hand if you'd rather take the road to happiness. They all raise their hands. But if you're not careful, if you're not thoughtful, you might go crashing down that other road, down past the warning sign, past the log, down the road to sadness or the road to anger, the road to misery. So we talk to kids about, well, which one would you choose if you had a choice? And they almost always, except for all but the most oppositional child, will choose the road to happiness. Well, how do you do that? Right there where the road splits, you see, we highlighted it in orange, that is decision point. At decision point, uh, that's where you have to do something. You have to stop and think. So we drop down that sign, stop and think right there at decision point. Well, what do you think? Well, what might happen if I do X? What might happen if I do Y? You know, and we have to, big decisions and little decisions all day long. Do I want chocolate or vanilla? Do I want paper or plastic? Do I want to sit here in traffic or, or, and wait it out? Or do I want to try to take a back road? We're an adult. What's your road to happiness? What's gonna happen if I do this or that? What's better? So you make choices all day long. If you were getting mad and your fist were balled up, here's a big choice, and you're about to hit your sister, stop and think, what might happen if I do this? You know, yes, I might feel good, short-term road to happiness, but I'll get in trouble. I might lose my phone, my iPod, my iPad. I might not be able to watch TV, whatever. So I might get in trouble. Is that a good part of your day? What is your road to happiness? We can also call it your road to success if you wanna talk about it academically. So we can change the language, the road to happiness or the road to success. Make great choices. So kids who come to us for therapy usually think the world happens to me, I have to melt down, right? It made me. But our message right in the beginning of therapy is you have a choice. Choose your road to happiness. Next tool that I wanna share, some of you might see if this resonates with you and think if it makes sense for your child. If not, there are more. Okay, this is called the big deal meter. And we're going to measure what's a big deal and what's worth freaking out about. And so in this, again, you can see the colors in the thermometer actually are the same as emotional GPS. So we have the purple phase, yellow phase, orange and red, I'll let, again, with the same number line. And so establishing it, we talk to kids about, um, well, what is a, a thermometer measure? Thermometer measures temperature. What is a speedometer measure on a car? How fast it goes, it's speed. Okay, so then what does a big deal a meter measure? What's a big deal and what's not? Here's how we teach it. On the bottom left, we ask kids to fill in, to tell us, what are some of the things that you actually melt down about? What really gets you so upset you're yelling and screaming? And you can see this group of kids said, when I hear the word no, makes me melt down in tantrum. When people are mean to my friends, okay. Um, when I mess up in art, we had one child who was very perfectionistic and he would melt down if he messed up, ripping up his paper and crying. And this uh, fourth kid said, getting punched. Okay, that makes a little more sense. I, I can see why you get that upset for that. 
So these were all like nines and tens for them, meltdown city. So then the adult caregiver, therapist or the teacher, parent, you on the right side, we're gonna fill in and we're gonna, we're gonna say some God forbids. And you can insert your own God forbids, you don't have to use mine, but the ones that we use, we, te we teach in a very sort of tongue in cheek way so it doesn't look as awful as some of the things that are listed here. You might be looking at me and saying, Mike, you are a dark person. But we say it sort of tongue in cheek. So I'll say, well, on this side, I'm gonna say a few things, other things that could happen in the world. And so what if God forbid, we don't think this will happen, but what if God forbid your parents died? and You could never see them again forever. It's a forever thing. How upset should you be for that? And kids will say, 100. Of course, this thermometer, it only goes up to 10. So this would become the new 10. So we establish a new 10. Essentially, what we're doing with the child is, child is we're going to take perspective and help kids realize things could be a lot worse than their everyday things that they react to. So parents die as a 10. So here's a tongue-in-cheek story, kind of ridiculous. But what if, God forbid, you were outside playing and in a freak accident, you're one of your legs got sliced off, bounce, bounce, and it rolls down the sewer so you can't get it back. I always add that part because smart alecky kids will say, well, doctors, doctors could just sew it back on. So I have to add the, the sewer part. So they, it can't be reattached. So it can't be reattached. You're gonna be in a wheelchair the rest of your life when you've been used to running around. How hard would that be? How upset do you think you would be? Is that as bad as your parents dying forever? Well, no one's died, they think. So that's a nine. Still very upsetting for sure. So then we add another one. For contrast, what if it's not your leg that's chopped off, but what if you're diving outside and you're playing? This time your pinky finger gets lopped off by accident, so you have nine fingers. You can still get around, you have your legs, but you only you have nine fingers. How upset would she be about that? And kids will rank that. This group said, some kids said seven, some kids said eight. So we put it in the middle. And I tell one more for good measure. Um, let's pretend, hypothetically, a meteor, a large asteroid were, was streaming through space, very close to Earth, and it was very highly magnetically charged, and it wiped out all of our telecommunications. No TV, satellite, cell phones, iPads, computers, all of our Wi-Fi disabled. And scientists figured it's going to take a year to get back. Not forever, but a year without all of our favorite things. So kids, I say, is that as bad as your leg getting chopped off forever? No. Pinky chopped off? No. And so these guys rated it a six or seven. So now they're thinking in this very critical way, right? Rating, what's a big deal, what's not a big deal? How upset should I get for, about something? And then we get to the punchline. Here's the big finish to this lesson. We, then you can see with these arrows, we ask the kids to now re-rate the original things that they said that they melt down about. Okay, so what if you hear no? compared to these things. Is that as bad as your parents dying? Is that still a 10? No. Is that as bad as your pinky finger getting chopped off? No. And you can see hearing no went all the way from a nine or 10 to a three for this child. Girl, I'm a little frustrated. Maybe I'm even okay. People are mean to my friends. That went up. If I mess up in art, is that as bad as computers breaking for a year? No, I messed up one time. I can fix it, right? So the arrow goes up. And you can see the direction of all these arrows, the kids successfully re-rated all the things, the everyday things that are not forever things. Most of these things they can fix or it'll get better on its own, they're not forever. So if you have things that go from a 10 to a four or five or six, then you can fix it. You can be a problem solver. We're gonna do a lesson on problem solving in a minute. If uh, your child rates it really high, really low rather, and it goes to a three or lower, you can say no biggie. So I tell kids, let me hear you say no biggie. So, no biggie. So look, the, the skill off of this is look for every chance you can to say no biggie for most everyday problems. And if something is like a medium, right, four, five, or six, then you can work on it. You can fix it. And this is the first thing. Can you rate it? How big of a deal is it? Can you say no biggie about this? These are some of the questions that you can use in question form with, with your child. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, let's keep going. The next one is another foundational one. Thought errors that really absolutely um, send the child 
into meltdowns. It's the expectations that they have about the world. Do they have flexible or inflexible expectations? So we have a lesson. It's called, this, is, well, this one was done for younger kids, so we called it must cliff, the word must, like I must get my way. Uh, for older kids, you can make it a little more mature sounding and use expectation. We teach them what the word expectation means. What does it mean when you expect something? Uh, kids will say, well, it's what I think is going to happen, right? So expectation cliff. So the story goes, you're outside, you're taking a walk and it's a lovely day and you walk yourself to a lovely view. You're standing on the edge of this cliff and you're looking at this beautiful body of water. What you don't know is that this water happens to be called the sea of despair, the sea of sadness and anger. Right? And for you, you're out in the world and you're getting closer and closer to the edge of the cliff. And we all, you, me, your parents, we all walk around the world with certain expectations in our head. We expect the world's gonna act a certain way. And so here are some of them. I must get my way, or I must always get my way. Right? And then we have kids select, we put brackets or rectangles around the words that are cliff words. These are words that are absolutes that nudge them closer and closer. These are the ones that set them up for a fall. So if you have an expectation that's really unreasonable, like I must always get my way, must is a cliff word, because must means um, I will die without this. What must we have? We must have food, water, and air. We will die without those. But must I have an ice cream cone? Must I have 15 more minutes of computer time, of iPad time? No, you will not die without that. But kids who melt down believe it. They very rigidly believe these extremes. I will die without this, right? Uh, always is also an absolute word. I didn't write that there. On the bottom, number three, it says always. Always means I must always get my way every single time. There is no instance in which it's okay that I don't get my way. And, and my way as well. My way is also, there's no other way. This is egocentric. It's gotta be my way. So I must always get my way. And we highlight those words. Then we have kids practice writing rescue words. If you notice in the picture, take a look, sort of right in the middle, hanging from the side of the cliff is a branch. In the cartoons, there's always a branch under a, a cliff where the character can possibly catch themselves and climb back up. So if you can rescue yourself, if you start to fall off expectation cliff, you can still rescue yourself by choosing rescue words. And I wanna show you some of the rescue words that we teach kids sometimes, maybe, and later are the big three. Sometimes I get my way and sometimes I don't, and I'll be okay. So that's the opposite of number one. I must get my way, I will die if I don't get my way. No, the truth is number one, sometimes I get my way and sometimes I don't. If you do this with a child, you can ask the child, one of these number ones is a lie that you tell yourself, and one of these is true. Which is the true statement and which is the lie? Well, the truth is sometimes I get my way and sometimes I don't, and I'm okay every time. I survive. The lie, the untruth is I will die if I don't get my way every time. That's not true. I have to get it now. Right? You can see the cliff words. Maybe I can get it later. So maybe and later are key words. Teach your children. And then if, again, if you have a reward system, say, I want, I'm gonna give you a, a token or a sticker every time I hear you saying sometimes or maybe or later. I must always go first. I must always win for the child who is a poor sport. No, maybe I'll win next time. Great, All right, so there we go. So this is expectation cliff. And the lesson is that it's your expectations. It's not the world. The world didn't make you melt down. That's the belief that the, the melting down child has. It's your expectations. So if you can get really realistic expectations and use rescue words, you can save yourself from melting down. I'm gonna skip this one. I wanna share this. This is instant hoping. This is the glass is half empty versus the glass is half full. This is the find the silver lining. If something goes wrong, there's two ways to react to something. 
there's more than that, but we're going to talk about two. So we tell the story of two kids, twins, who have the same exact DNA, identical twins, and they're drinking their favorite beverage, which is chocolate milk. So here we have two glasses, and they both drink their chocolate milk down to the same level. And now there's half, it's half, the, the cup has, is half full or half empty with the liquid. The red brother, brother with the red thought bubble says, oh, he looks at it and says, this stinks. I only have half left. This stinks, right? So he has a pretty negative attitude. How does he feel? He feels mad. The other brother with the same exact amount, looking at the same situation, looks at his glass and he says, wow, well, at least I still have half left. I'm going to enjoy the rest of this. He's happy. So what do you think? Which, which brother seems like he's a happier guy? The blue one, right? Well, at least. The person who sees the glass is half full. And so try, whenever something goes wrong, again, you can just praise it. You can say, I'm looking to see. I want to hear every time you can say, well, at least. You can add it to a sticker chart or a reward system. I want to hear you say a well at least when something goes wrong. And I can tell kids, you can even use well at least for the worst setbacks. My example, I, I actually tell a forever thing. My grandmother lived to be 102 years old and she died about three years ago. And of course I was crushed. She was just my favorite person in the whole world. So nurturing with it my entire life, really fun and engaging. And so when she died, of course, we were very sad. But we also were doing well, at least all over the place. Well, at least I had her for 47 years of my life, 47 years with my favorite person. Uh, well, at least both of my kids got to enjoy her for 16 and 18 years, respectively. They had her in, in their lives. Well, at least. So you can, well, at least even awful situations, find the silver lining. Say well at least. So that's another coping skill. Maybe that one would resonate with your child. Next, I'm going to talk about um, two things before we go to question and answer. I want to just touch on the last two bits, which are uh, the assertiveness and problem solving. Remember from the list in the beginning, those are two additional kindlings for meltdowns. So the first one is called the power of I versus the boo of you. So in healthy assertiveness, you're letting people know what you need. You wanna stick up for yourself, but nicely in a way that where people can help you. So here we have the power of I, and you can all do this with me. So in your home, wherever you are watching me, uh, take your finger, your index finger, point to yourself, point to your chest and say like, this is your core. This is where your heart is. And so in here, this is like where your spirit is very core of you. And this is the source of your power, where your heart is, the core of you. So when you talk, when you use your words, when you use the power of I, you point to yourself, your core, and you say, I. So this is your power. I feel I need, or I'd like, I'd like a turn. Right? So when you say I, you point to yourself, your lungs, force the air up, up your lungs, through your voice box, ah, and your mouth forms it. Your, your mouth and tongue form the words. So this is your power. Right? You don't need power with your fists. So you point to yourself and you say, I feel confused. If a child in school or over homework can say, I feel confused and that's it, the caregiver, now you can, you can begin helping just with three words. I feel confused. Point to yourself, that's your power. You know, I'd like a turn. I, I need a break. I need some space, right? So I need is a little more urgent. I'd like, if it's something you'd like. So for kids who have a hard time with this, just beginning with the power of I giving them this little script is like magic. And then it's something that they can repeat and repeat. And eventually they can develop more, you know, fancy language like, um, um, you know, can you do this for me, right? A little, more, a little more of a natural way to say it, but a short script beginning with I is a great way to teach it in the beginning. That's your power. The boo of you pointing out, you lose your power. You always do this, you never do that. You beep, right, if you insult someone. You always, you never, it puts the listener on the defensive. They don't really wanna help you that much. 
and uh, you, it makes it harder for them to help you. And the question to the child, does that person, if you say you always, you always lie, you never help me, do they even know how you're feeling or what you need? No, you're just on the attack, so you lose power. You're not helping yourself. So point to yourself. That's why it's the boo of you, but the power of I. Essentially, it's the I, I statements that have been taught in counseling for 20, 30 years. But we're adding the part that is powerful and point to yourself. So that's the power of I. Be assertive. Stick up for yourself nicely in a way that's going to work for you. Last slide we're going to get to before Q&A. Instant problem solving. I've taught this to 16 year olds using this picture. It doesn't have to be really complex when we talk about problem solving. I'll show you a, another, a more complex way to teach it in a second. So life is like an obstacle course, right? Make a move, get past your obstacle. All day long, life is dropping these boulders in our path. So let's pretend you're still on the, your road to happiness and you want something. You wanna get done your homework so you can start playing, right? You want to, you want to play with your sibling, but you guys are disagreeing about what to do. So there's an obstacle to your happiness, to what you want. Um, right? You wanna keep playing, but it's bedtime. How can you handle this? So in this metaphor, you're walking the, your ro the road of your life and there's an obstacle, this mountain that's dropped in your path. Well, this character in the picture has four options. He could go over, around. If he has digging tools, he, he could go under the mountain. Or if he had like the mole man, like corkscrew kind of thing, he could go through the mountain. He could carve his way through the mountain. Over, around, under, through. Four options. Remember, the person who is weak at problem solving doesn't generate options. So we're showing that there's four ways to handle something, up to four. And so now in real life, let's use a life example. Let's name it. Name an obstacle. Name something that got in the way of what you wanted. So you have to name it to tame it. So that mountain, for the first step is let's, let's write down what the, what the problem is. Right? What's the obstacle you have? So my obstacle is um, they already started playing soccer and they're saying I can't get in the game. Okay, well, what are four things you could do? I could run and get another player, another kid. So we'll go and create even teams. I can wait until the game's over, maybe. I can go find a different thing to do. Or maybe four, I can go ask a teacher for help, you know, four. So you wanna do it. And when you do this, see if you can ask the child to come up with the, the options. It's very important. It's a gift to the child to do that option thinking, to develop that muscle. So try not to rescue, hang back and see if your child can come up with some options, okay? And generating options, pick one. Which one do you think is, will, is most likely to work? Number two, Good luck. If it doesn't work, don't freak out. You can always try one, three, or four. You have options. So we're teaching this word option. List four ways past your obstacle. Make a move. Right? Instant problem solving. This is a, a more formal problem solvers club, we call it. Um, it's a more language-based worksheet. Some kids like to use language more than an image. You know, so one, list your problem. Two, it made me feel. Frustrated, sad, lonely. Number three, list two or three options that you can do. Four, circle one, A, B, or C that you think might work best. And five is try it, good luck. If it works, congratulations. If it doesn't work, no biggie. You can go back to number four. All right, last. So today we talked about a lot of skills that you could teach. I hope that you picked one or two or three that you could use. We talked about emotional GPS and levels of frustration. I have one more presentation coming up in on January, um, February 24th. And that's part, I have a two-parter. And this is actually the contents of my book. Part one is the first half of the book and part two is the second half. And these are all the skills that you would need to actually reinforce the kids using these coping skills. Part one is motivating kids with creating a positive cycle. How can we positively reinforce kids using their coping skills. And, and part two is using uh, rewards, using consequences to start to shape behavior and help kids actually 
and choose better and worse, better coping behaviors, and we can shape their behavior to avoid the negative behaviors. So a little commercial. I sent, uh, hopefully we can pass on to you, we can forward a flyer that has links to these two presentations in case you would like to attend some additional ones. And again, this is my book. And that's the end of the slide. So. Mike, that was fantastic. Thank you so okay. much. I think you can tell from the comments, people were asking, will this be recorded? I want to watch it again. I'm going to be sending everyone Mike's slides tomorrow. So mm -hmm. you, even if you were taking notes, you're going to get these slides and we are recording it and I will share the recording with you. Um, and Mike graciously is happy to stay on for a, a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, someone, Leah put in the chat, Mike, back when um, you were on the slide about the different reasons for a meltdown. There was one that you skipped over and she was curious about what <laughs> that was and if you can okay. just illuminate that. That was, I remember it actually. Um, I don't even have to re refer to the slides. That was um, part whole relationships. Some kids, you can see I sort of over talked my, my, my time there, so I could see I wanted to skip a couple of things. Uh, but that one was hard hole relationships is the child who can't see the forest for the trees. The child who over focuses on certain details. And so the way that plays out is the child who kind of obsesses about rules of a game, for instance, and they forget the big picture is we're supposed to be having fun. But you might know the child who is like they're playing a game and they start to argue they start to argue about the rules so you know it was fair it was the fair ball foul ball it was fair it was foul and they will argue and they won't give it up they're inflexible they're sort of stuck on that they're focused on the detail i have to win this argument but they forget the big picture recess is only a half hour we're going to waste it and you might have this at home where a child you know will argue to the teeth about a detail and um so it's that, or they might be the rule police and they're overreacting if someone else does something that's against the rules. So they're correcting everyone and, and they're frustrated and, out of, and they get bent out of shape if other people are off task when they themselves might be off task commenting on it. So that's what that one was. That's more just, you know, cause for flare ups. I saw another question early. Yeah, I think it was from Stephanie and I had yes. chatted to her. Stephanie, if you want to unmute to ask. Yep. Your I read it. Mm -hmm. So um, not to make this like about me, <laughs> but because maybe it'll apply to other people. I yes. have a, a three year old who is my clone and I was she goes from grr to like flipping out. There's no other. Yes. Stages that and and so my question was based on that and when you were talking about the must cliff or expectation thing how yeah. much of that is reasonable to try to use for a three-year-old she's almost four but um <laughs> okay so I, I like i could try the whole swoop in and do all that stuff i think that would be useful and like some of that stuff would be good but i guess my question is some of what she's doing is developmentally appropriate I would imagine, and she she does think she should not have to share her toy or whatever. So how reasonable, how young is yeah. reasonable? Great question. So there's two parts to it. One is partly age, and then the other part is um, for all ages, what happens for that child who skips yellow or who only stays in yellow for about, you know, one heartbeat and then they go right to orange or red. So first, let me talk about the age thing. Children four-year-old and younger are crazy people. Okay, um, they are, they, their um, human brain actually has not grown in quite enough yet. So they are three years old, two and three are unreasonable people. Four years, four year olds are just gaining the beginnings of reason, but in a, in a tired or hungry moment, they can easily slip back into the twos and threes. So, so there you're actually socializing your child. And yes, it is expected for the three year old still to tantrum. In fact, they see, you know, three is worse than the twos. It's called the terrible twos, but no one stops to give the threes a nickname, I don't think, unless you know of one. Um, and quick story, my son, three years old, you know, he could get angry. He had, he would go from purple to red, especially if he were hungry. He was really 
sort of his his hunger was he would get hungry instantly. He didn't have any range, and so we were out, and we knew we were getting close to when he would probably be hungry. We were racing home, and we said, "Sammy, this is my son, who you saw tonight," um, he said, "Sammy, we're you want Cheerios? We're gonna have Cheerios? Yes, Sammy want Cheerios." So we were racing home. And we were, you know, we were going to give him like a handful of Cheerios on like his the height chair or whatever on the table, and then we were going to make his real lunch. We knew we were cutting it close. Sammy Cheerios, yes, Sammy want Cheerios. Came in, he sat down, we put Cheerios on the table, and he goes, "No, Sammy, no one Cheerios," and they're all on the floor, right? And so that was completely a snapshot of the threes. And I've worked with so many parents of three year olds, and it's that. So we need to expect that, and so. There, for the three-year-old and even up to four, you want to reflect, oh, you are hungry. You're upset. You want to label their experiences because you're helping them to develop the awareness of their body states. And they're developing that, the, the language of their, their states and their emotions. You're mad. You're sad. You're lonely. You're upset. So you want to label their experience. And then they just need time to calm down, right? Again, it's, it's that anger wave. It crashes, it recedes, same thing. So for my son, once he reached that point, he just had to scream and tantrum in his chair and he had to wait it out. And when he finally screamed it out, then he could have his Cheerios and he could have his grilled cheese or whatever we made. You know, so that's that piece for you, for all people who are working with and taking care of four, year old, four years old and younger. Okay, but for everyone else, if you have older kids, um, a lot of people say, oh, my, my, my child is happy and he's calm. And he goes right to orange and red. His yellow phase is like this. And that's often when kids come to therapy, like that's the very beginning of therapy. So I view my job as the therapist is to teach more and more of the preventive skills so that we can kind of shoehorn, we can expand. We wanna make that yellow bigger so that someone, the child can develop a greater range of real-time coping skills so that they don't even have to crash into orange or red. So there it's the skill building piece and repetition. And that's where, you know, teaching a skill, having an expectation, adding a sticker chart very specific to that. You know, we wanna see you taking a break, say no biggie, you know, star for you. And then you can help the child learn. And same thing for older kids on the, you can make it less cute. You can still put a, an older child on a, on a reward system. In fact, if you can make it to my February 24th presentation, that one is all about the positivity and adding a reward system. So um, it'll, it'll reinforce what we talked about tonight. And I'll send that out, Mike. I'll, I'll, I'll send, yeah, make sure people get that information about the 24th. Yeah, um, sure. Hallie had a question, if we can do another one. Yeah, Hallie, I have time. Did you see me up before? I was like, oh, I want to make sure I get my question. <laughs> um, that was fantastic. And I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, great, Thank great you. information. I had two questions um, about two different slides. Um, the first one, the stop, think slide, um, you know, where you had the fork in the road. The road to what happiness. What about the kids that have impulse control, impulse issues? Yes. You know, there's a whole other element, of, you know, potentially they have attention issues or impulsivity. Yeah. How do you deal with that when it's kind of almost very difficult for them to, to do that stop, think more than yeah. average, I guess you could say. Absolutely. This is, their version of the that short yellow phase, right? Mm -hmm. They're so in the moment, they're so, they, they're lacking um, the self-awareness in the moment to see that they're approaching decision point. And so they're, they're, they're moving so fast. So there are a few things that I, that I would work with the child on in therapy, which is um, one is actually delayed gratification. Like if your child asks for something, if you just, you know, you might want to, you know, they might say, please, they might do the whole thing, but you say, hey, yeah, hold on, I'm just going to count to 10. And so you literally go like, mm -hmm. oh, don't grab, wait, and just practice waiting. Mm -hmm. And you can vary it. I'm going to, in your mind, I'm going to count to three. Sometimes you give it right away, but you can vary it. Child waits. Okay. So that's one little, little thing you can do to help with delay of gratification. Mm -hmm. We also have a, another it's not appropriate for tonight, but a coping skill called How's Your Engine Running? And it's based on a book by the same name. So if you do an Amazon search for How's Your Engine Running, something related to that title, um, it has to do with your, your body is like an engine. It's running fast, medium, or slow. And if it's fast, you're too impulsive, you're hyper. 
-hmm. And it's hard to make, it's hard at decision point. If you're too slow, you can't focus. You don't have enough focus on your, you're like this. You're kind of like, you're kind of zoned out. If your engine's slow and medium, if your engine's medium, you have, your body is like relaxed enough and you're focused. You can do your best work. You can make, you can make great decisions. So just learning about the child's engine is a part of it. But we should, we should expect the impulsive child by virtue of that sentence <laughs> is going to have a hard time executing a decision, but that could be all of your conversation decisions. What a great decision. I like how you thought about that. Did you think first? Um, and again, one more, I don't mean to do a plug, but we'll actually address a lot of this the way that we're, in the next, next presentation on the 24th, we're gonna talk about how you can develop a child's self-awareness through your reflection of what they're doing. Your verbal, the way, you, the way that you interact with them. Um, and basically it, it's an extension of what I said about four-year-olds and three-year-olds when we say, oh, you're happy, you're sad. There you're, they're, you're developing their awareness of their states. Mm -hmm. But then the rest of their lives, when they're in elementary and beyond, you can say, you're reflecting what they're doing. Oh, what a great choice. You did that. Well, you're climbing so high. Um, yeah. you, you know, so you're, you're reflecting their decisions and I don't have time tonight to get into it, but tune in next time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you'll get all the answers, I think, or many of the answers for this question. Thank you. May I ask the quick question on silver linings or am I, are we out of time? Because I don't want to hog you here. Yeah. Um, like, okay. if, anyone, if anyone needs to go, I won't be offended if you have to go, you know, tend to your family or anything. But um, I can stay a few more minutes if anyone wants to hear uh, the answer to this question. So silver linings, I love that, you know, reframing your perspective. Um, what if the child really fights back on that um, and really struggles uh, with seeing the positive. Do you just keep practicing, keep saying, okay, well, how can you look at this a different way? Because uh, it doesn't always come natural, as you said. What can you do to help mm -hmm. kind of veer that towards the positive? Yeah, um, for the child who is in sort of a repeat negative cycle, uh, it can be hard because that your child has learned this. The child has trained him or herself to think this way. And so it's almost like you're trying to convince them of something that's their reality. It's different than their reality. Yeah. So there are ways within cognitive behavioral therapy to do it. Oh, here's another resource. Um, I have a YouTube channel that has some additional videos. Um, one, is, one is similar to this. There's one on an anger unit, but there's also one on negative thinking. And so, and they're broken into like, you know, seven to 10 minute or five to 10 minute um, brief videos covering different skills. And so there's one called, what lens, rose colored glasses, what lens do you see the world through? And so that could be a resource. And that's just a piece of therapy for you to continue the conversation. But we, what, there's a bit of an art to it, but we wanna basically start with, well, there are a lot of ways to see the world, you know? And I'm not saying that you're wrong, but there are certain ways. And so when I position it for a child, we do a compare contrast. Like you could see, I had two, the two cups of water, right? Uh, in, you know, there's positive and there's negative. And you, ru you run through the outcome of what if, what if you think through the gray lens, the negative lens, how does your life go? And then you contrast it with a positive lens. And then you have the child do the evaluation. Because if you're bossing the child and saying, you've got to think positively, He'll dig in his heels, right? But if you can have him do the evaluation, well, which one of these seems like a happier way to be? Oh, we'll go, well, that one. Okay, well, we could practice that one, you know? And it's so important that I would even be happy to give you rewards if you practice that one, you know? So that's a way to address it. Um, but if there's any way for you to get your child to evaluate the merits, you know, if there are two ways to look at something, which way is better? Which way would you choose if you could choose? And then and see where the conversation goes. Good, cool. Mike, we're gonna throw one last one at you. Okay. It might be the challenge to end the night, but we're gonna find the silver lining in it that so many people stayed 
and have learned so much with you and are going to come back on the 24th because I'm going to send out the info about that presentation. So Leah asked if you have any suggestions for implementing these strategies. She is a teacher of mm -hmm. older students, middle or high school. Is there something we could take away and apply there? Yeah. Every strategy that I said is applicable to people of any age, you know, four or 94. It's just a matter of how cutely you express it. So you can change like the dino brain. You can pick up, just do a Google search and Google image search for the triune brain or the three level brain. And you'll see there's dozens of images of, you know, reptilian brain, mammal brain, human brain. And so you can use that to help to teach your students. Um, three levels of brain. If your reptilian brain takes over, you're raging, you're, you can't focus. It's not smart, it's a reptile, right? Your human brain is uh, smart. And so then there's things that you can do, you know, can you calm down? Can you take deep breaths to deliver the oxygen to your brain to slow, you know, to take you out of the, dino, the, the uh, reptile brain, the reptilian brain. So it's just the language that you use to make it less cute. Um, expectation cliff is just as valid. I uh, just call it expectation cliff, but the thoughts involved are the same. And all you have to do is adapt the language. So for instance, if you have, let's say you're teaching middle school or high school, and there are some students who are perfectionistic, that's another form of, that's another expectation. I must get everything right, or I must, I must always get everything right, or the, the inverse, I must never get anything wrong. That's the perfectionist, right, who freaks out, they're so stressed out for tests and they shut down. So you can show them expectation cliff, you can say you're on the edge of the cliff, and you would write, just, you just change the words, you know, the scripts, it's underneath the cliff. So it's, I must get everything right, or um, everyone needs to like me. Um, I must never be embarrassed or, you know, whatever it is, you know, is that true? Are you going to die if you're embarrassed? I mean, I, there's a saying, I died of embarrassment, but truly you've survived every time you've been embarrassed. So it's just a matter of same concept. And I think it's still helpful to have the image the visual. Um, or if you feel like a, a, a teenager is going to poo poo it, don't you, I don't care. Don't use the image and just, just compare and contrast the language, you know, I must get everything right. I will die if I get something wrong versus sometimes I get something wrong. Sometimes I get it right. I can learn from it if I get it wrong, right? Or it's, it's expected for learners learning a new topic to get things wrong, you know? So you can, so all of these really have, can be, can be converted. You can rate what's, what's, what's a big deal or not. Um, just, call it a, just call it a five point rating scale. Just don't call it a big deal -a meter <laughs> you know? So that's my suggestion. Every one of these things can be adopted or adapted rather. And um, just with language and collectively, you know, as a teacher, you can also even have, you know, a credit system, a point system and the whole class might contribute to it. And then if the whole class is working on, you know, positive coping or positive, you know, uh, cooperation skills, getting along social skills, then perhaps you give them a homework pass. So their reward might be like a homework pass. You know, give them one night without an assignment uh, or a bonus you know, recess or something like that. So it's really desirable for a student. You can even have a little bit of a reward system that they're working towards. I know that rewards are a bit of a four letter word these days. We can talk about that on the 24th. I'll address that then. Um, anyway, so that's my response to the, that question. I've got an answer for everything. I've been around for a while. Mike, it's so helpful. I hope you got to see a little bit of the appreciation that was coming at you in the chat. Um, a lot of gratitude for what you shared tonight. So uh, folks, I will be sending you the slides and the info about the 24th and the recording. And um, I just, you know, look for, we will continue to do uh, these parent presentations um, because it's really clear that they're they're important and meaningful and we we want to give everyone the support you need so mike thank you so much thank you all for joining it was really fun to share this with you and i'm seeing that there's a 
song from Kids Corner about meltdowns. I never heard it. So I'm really excited to check that out. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's it's great. I think you'll appreciate it, especially in your line of work. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I can't wait to hear it. See it. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. Good night, everybody. Be well. Thank you, Mike. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.